thank you for your word, for your love, for your grace, um, for the foundation that we have holding in our hands or in the apps, God. We just pray, God, that you would speak to us. And let us realize it's a sure foundation. It, it, it will never uh, do anything but guide our lives in the proper direction. So may you be glorified, God. Speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to be talking about day one, heaven, earth, light, and time. We'll be addressing the following questions. And tell me if you've ever heard any of these questions. When did time begin? Ever heard that? I will, I will answer that question this morning. I got all the answers because I got God's word. How many heavens were created by God? How many heavens? When were the angels created? Did God really create our world, the universe, and all life in six literal days? What is theistic evolution, or what is a theistic evolutionist? Doesn't the Bible say something like a day is like a thousand years with the Lord? So couldn't a day in the Bible be like a million of years? I mean, isn't a day in Genesis 1 just an allegorical term for ages or something else? We've heard something like that. I mean, I've heard something like that. Did Jesus say he actually created the days, or does he believe in an actual six-day creation? So we're going to answer those questions this morning. And so take some notes, write some things down so you know when people ask you these questions, you'll have an answer for the reason and the faith and the hope that you believe in, like we should, right? So last week we talked about the unique importance of the book of Genesis. Genesis means beginnings. Got it? So it is the beginning, it is the genesis, it is the foundation for all that we talked about. Genesis is the beginnings of the origin or the beginnings of, uh, of our origin. So pop up that wordle there. I made a little wordle there uh, with all the different words. It, it, it's the genesis of uh, the universe, so the solar system, of our atmosphere, of the hydrosphere, of man, of woman, of marriage, of a seven-day week, of day, of time, of uh, earth. Languages, government, nations, religion, sin, death. It is the origin, it is the genesis of all those. We're going to find out how all that happened in the book of Genesis. Not only that, but it's also the genesis. It's all the beginnings of all the doctrines and teachings. They normally have their beginnings in Genesis, their foundation in Genesis. So we see another wordle there of sin, redemptions, justifications, Jesus Christ, the personhood of God, the kingdom of God, the fall of Israel, the promise of the Messiah, all those things, all those things have their genesis, their beginnings, their foundation here in the book of Genesis. God's word is our foundation. We believe that God's word should be understood literally in the straightforward context. And by context, I mean the literary context, the, the, the historical context in which it was written. The proper way to Interpret Genesis 1 is, I don't think, don't interpret it at all. Accept it to mean what it says and says what it means in the literary context of what it is written. It's reliable. It must always be your starting point and my starting point for all that we believe. Our marriage, how we raise our kids, leadership, all those different topics are talked about in God's Word. And we must always doubt there. God's Word will never leave you astray. It's always right. It is never wrong. You stop and you say, we talked about a little bit about the Big Bang Theory last, last, last week, and, and people believe that, that 15 billions of years ago that there was this dense point in space and it exploded and expanded to everything we have today. And if you asked a person, well, who, where did that dense point spot come from of which all this came, they'll say, well, we don't know. In other words, there has to be some starting point, and their starting point is someplace that they have no idea, and then they make things up. I'm going to refer to evolution as a mythology. I'll be referring it to as a model of different things, and I'll be telling you why uh, I, I don't believe there's truth or, or, uh, or for any of the aspect of it, and we'll be talking about it over the next month and why I believe that. We then talked about the attributes of God, and I have another wordle for the attributes of God, that he's eternal, that he was and always will be. God is from everlasting to everlasting. He's always existent. He's self-existent. He's loved. He's faithful. He will always keep his promises. He does not lie. He's sovereign. That means he's in complete control of everything. Isn't that good to know? He's in complete 
control of everything. We were singing a worship song this morning. I'm going to interrupt myself. And I was sitting there thinking here, and it says, I will lift my eyes. Your beloved needs needs you now. I will lift my eyes to the calmer of the ocean's raging wild. And I thought, man, the ocean of this world is raging wild. What a crazy week. I can only watch so much TV. I got to what? Turn it on. As somebody said the other day, I got to fast from TV. I got to fast from it. You know why? Because the ocean's raging. And you know what you need to do? You need to what? Lift your eyes. You need to lift your eyes to the calmer. See, that's an attribute of God. He's a calmer. He's a calmer in the, in the raging oceans that we have today. Anyway, he's merciful. He's kindness. He's holy. He hates sin. He's just. He must punish sin. In other words, the Bible is the book that claims to be the word of one who knows everything. He's all-knowing. It's the word of one who claims that he's always been there. He's eternal. He doesn't lie. He was there in the beginning. Therefore, he knows actually what really happened because no one else was there except God. So, Last week, we started in Genesis 1.1, and we said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When we look at um, Genesis 1.1, if you can pop that up there. The word God, I said, was the word Elohim. Elohim. Say Elohim. Elohim is a plural word for God. Now, the reason I, I kind of went a little fast, somebody said, Brad, can you explain that? They, they told me this week, and so I had to sing this song, El Shaddai. Cool song, right? When we sing the song El Shaddai, uh, with the word El, if you can pop that up there, the word El is the word singular for what word? God. So El is singular. Elohim is what? Plural. El is what God, singular. Elohim is plural. Shaddai means what? Almighty. So when we go El Shaddai, we're saying God what? Almighty is what we're saying. When we see El, Elion, Elion means the Most High. So El is what? God. El, Elion is God what? Most High or oh, Most High God. It's referring to Jehovah God. It's referring to Adonai. Adonai is the Lord or Master. So when we're singing, we're singing God Almighty, God Almighty, Most High God. You're my Lord. You're my master. That's what we're singing when we're singing El Shaddai, El Shaddai. And, but it's referring to Jehovah God, the singular God, the Father God. You got that? It's singular. But when we read Genesis, and it says, in the beginning God created, the word Hebrew is not the singular term, but rather Elohim, the plural. It's a clear reference to the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We know that all things were created by Jesus. Nothing was created that was created, it says in Colossians. It says that in John 1, 1 also, John 1, 2. And so we got to realize that Jesus was there, God the Father was there, and then the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters we talk about. So just want to make sure I clarify that, that we see the Trinity, and, and, and that's what it means. In other words, it was God, not some random blind, blind chance that fashioned the universe. So it said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It didn't say God created the heaven. It said God created the what? Heavens. There are three heavens. What? The Bible speaks of three heavens, and I will explain them to you. The word um, is uh, shamayin, and it can mean the visible universe, the sky, the atmosphere. Uh, It could also mean the abode of God. In Psalm 104, 12, it reads, By them the birds of the heavens have their home. They sing among the branches. Well, where do the birds live? They live in our atmosphere, right? So when it says the birds of the heavens, heavens actually refers to our atmosphere. If you look outside, with the exception of the sun, or if you see the moon, everything that we see is referred to the first heaven of heavens. All right? So normally what you see, but at nighttime, when the lights go out, you see another heaven. That's where all the stars, Isaiah 13, 10 says, for the stars of heaven 
and their constellations. Then it talks about what's going to happen at the end times. They will not give their light. The sun will not be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. In other words, this reckon the stars in heaven, is also talking about the space outside of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is a space. The space out of that is called outer space. That's where they get the word what? Outer space. It's the space out to our atmosphere. So we have the atmosphere called the heaven in God's word. We've got to look at it in context, right, of what it means. The birds don't sing twerping up there in the, in the outer atmosphere. They sing in our atmosphere. The stars don't hang out in our atmosphere. They are in the outer atmosphere, the outer space. And there's a third heaven that is used in God's word, and it's the place where the abode of God. In Revelation eleven nineteen says, then the temple of God was opened, where? In heaven. Paul actually said in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12, 2, that he was actually caught up in the third heaven. He referred to it as the third heaven, which is the place where God abides. So you have the first heaven, the second. So how many heavens are there in God's word? Three heavens. So it speaks of three different heavens, and here's the biblical context for that. Now, it's interesting uh, that we see that everything is created within the six days. So here is a question. God created millions and millions of angels, and I want to make sure you understand, despite popular secular belief, when you die, your spirit does not become an angel. How many of you have heard people say that? Oh, they died. They're an angel. No, they're not an angel. An angel is a separate created being than we are. Our spirits will go to be with the Lord, but not as an angel. We will see angels there, but we will not become an angel. You see, it says in first in Colossians 1:16, for by him, that's referring to Jesus Christ, all things were created. Now notice, things where? In heaven. How many heavens? Three. In heaven and in, on the earth. Visible and what? Invisible. Whether they're thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, that refers a lot to the angelic world. How many things were created through him? What? All things were created through him and for him. At the end of this chapter 21, and the start, verse 1 of verse chapter 2, it says, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And then two one says, thus, the heavens and the earth, and then what? All the hosts of them were finished. The hosts of here and the hosts what? In heaven, up there. Both places were created by the end of the sixth day. Both the earthly realm and the heavenly realm were populated by the sixth day of creation. Genesis 20, 11 supports that. It says, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holier. How would it? Job brings up something very interesting. The book of Job, chapter 38, verse 4 and 7, reads this. God's talking to Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Oh, oh I, don't, I don't know. He's, he's, he's putting Job into place. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. And then verse 7 says this. When the morning stars sang together... And all the sons of God shouted for joy. Many people believe that the morning stars refer to the angelic beings worshiping and singing together. And the sons of God refer to the angelic beings worshiping and shouting for joy. If that is a true context, and that's what, what God meant when he said that, then maybe the angels were created in day one or day two at that point because that was when the foundations were actually laid. Something for you to think about, dig deeper, but there's no doubt that angels were created by day 
Sixth, I believe it could be in day one or day two. Genesis 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it describes the earth. The earth was without form and void. Earth means the earth that we live in, the land, the dirt, the matter that we actually had. And the matter when God created the earth, it was formless. It didn't have any descriptive aspects. It was void. It was empty. It was just a bunch of matter. In other words, everything for life at that time was not yet set up. It was not yet organized. Therefore, it was without form. And I think, man, that's kind of like my life before I came to God. My life before I came to light was pretty much a bunch of matter, formless, empty. And that's exactly what we see happening. And everything for eternal life was not yet set up for my life. But we're going to see as we move through verse 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way down through 31, we're going to see how the earth, the atmosphere, the universe, everything in it was created, the order in which it was all created, and the amount of time it took for God to create them all. It says in verse 2, the darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The word darkness means darkness, absence of light. In his creation, there was no light. If I showed you a picture of the earth, it would look a picture of a what? A black screen. You couldn't see the what? Earth. Because you need to have light to have some aspect of, of visibility to see an outline. Or There's nothing. It was just darkness, absolute darkness. And, and, and it, it, it talks about, um, at that time, uh, the face of the deep, Faces front, and the deep means like the, the depth of, it doesn't matter, all the way down, any crevice you can go down in this matter, darkness was every word. And it says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So what happens is you have this darkness, this piece of matter, water is covering this entire globe at that time, and the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, is hovering over the waters at that time. The word hovers is only used three times. One time in Deuteronomy 32, it says, as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young. And I just picture this, this carrying, this aspect of the Holy Spirit just overseeing every aspect of this creation. And so I want to make sure we have some real clear things that's happening. The Bible straightforwardly declares that the world did not create itself that the world did not happen by chance. In the beginning, God created it. The world was created by God, who by definition is eternal and has always been there. If you believe Genesis 1-1, then you'll believe the rest of the thing. You don't have anything else with God's word. And that's why it's so important to stop and to start here. Verse 3 says, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good. You know, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but they will have the light of life. And then when you ask Jesus Christ into your heart, he gives you the light in your darkness, just as he gave light there. Now, as you look at that picture of their light, tell your neighbor, what was the source of that light? Tell your neighbor, what was the source of that light? Go ahead. Okay, the suns and the stars were created day what? Not eight. Four. <laughs> day eight? The, the stars and the sun and the moon weren't created to day four. So who had to be the source of that light? God, Jesus, Jesus. I love that. Jesus. He was the source of light. He spoke it into existence. He said, let there be light. I like this next slide, right? There you go, lights on. Uh. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. That was great. There you go. And it didn't work. Never mind. <laughs> it's a delay. It's a delay switch. There you go. Yeah. Ah! Let there be light. See, the source of light was created by God Himself. So often, when we think of the source of light, we think of some luminous body, like a light bulb or like a sun 
or uh, an illuminous, a reflective body like the moon. One is a source of light and one can reflect light and that's how we're able to see things at this time. But we got to remember that after this earth is destroyed and we have the new heaven and the new earth, it says in Revelation 22, 5 that there will be no light there. I mean, there will be no night there. There's no need for a lamp nor light of the sun. For why? The Lord God gives them light. When we're with God in heaven and the new heaven and the new earth, it'll, it'll be a light. There won't be, it'll just be light. You know, if you turn all this off, we'd have, don't Bill, if you turn all this off, we'd have light coming in from the window. We wouldn't see the source of light, but we'd have light. Does that mean it'll just be light everywhere because of God? So anytime a light is covering a side of the earth, this really is everywhere around the earth you have the light. And it says, and God saw the light and it was good. Notice that God now makes a qualitative study, God's uh, qualitative judgment about the light. He said the light was good. In other words, the light wasn't bad. And I want to bring to your attention that not only does he say the light was good, but as we continue the account of, Gen of Genesis on through, we're going to see he continues to say many things were good. In day one, God saw the light and he said it was good. In day three, when God made the land uh, earth and he separated in the seas, he said it was good. And day three, verse 12, when he made the grass, the herbs and the fruits that yielded fruit, he said it was good. On day four, verse 18, when God made the stars, the moon, the sun, he saw that it was good. In day five, when God made the sea creatures and the, and the fish of the seas and the birds, he said it was good. In day six, when God made the land animals and the beasts of the earth according to his kind and all the creepy bugs on the earth, God said it was good. And in day 6, verse 31, when he created man, it says, then God saw everything that he made, and he said it was what? Very good. Now, this is going to be a point I'm going to go back to, because when God creates something in the first six days, everything about the first six days and all of creation was only what? Good. It's important that you remember that, because that debunks the aspect of evolution that I will talk with in, the, in a little bit. Verse 4 said, God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. The word divided actually means to divide into part. God now starts dividing the light from the darkness. He calls the light a very clear word. He calls it day, and he calls the darkness night. He does that. And then he says... So the evening and the morning were the very first day. He takes the time to explain not just night and day, but we're going to now call something called time, where you have night and you have day at this point. It could be at this time there might be an aspect of revolution, how, he, how he's dividing it. He's still the source of light because the sun didn't come till day what? Four. So the sun didn't come till day four, but we still have a source of light, which has to be God. But now it's being divided into one part and then into the other. Jewish people, when does a Jewish day start? In the evening, right? Good students. In the evening. They run from sunset to what? Sunset. And it's because of what it says there in verse 5. It says, so the evening and the morning, pop that back up, was the first day. See, it starts in the evening, and then it goes to morning. So there it starts from evening, and it goes through morning, and it comes back up to evening. That is the first day. If you asked anybody and said, hmm, evening through a morning back to evening, how much time is that? In context, you'd read that. If you asked a child, ask your five-year-old, hey, we have evening and then we have morning. Oh, that means the day's gone by 24 hours, if they understand 24 hours. In the literary context of what's being spoken, he made sure he said evening and morning. So when did time begin? This is when time began, right here. Time began and is clarified by the first evening and morning, and that is day one. God existed before time, because that was what day one is. 
So a question comes up. So did God really create the universe, the earth, and all the plants in six literal days? I mean, you've seen this. You have space and time, the atmosphere, the dry land and plants, the sun, moon, and stars, the flying creatures, the creeping uh, creatures, the land animals, and the humans, and the bugs, and all those different things. In other words, if you were to teach that, some people would go, I believe that. Some people, I believe part of that. In fact, some people will say, well, I believe uh, that God did day one and day two, but I don't believe that God did day three, day four, day five, day six. Many people in a, many different churches would agree. I'm not talking about people that don't go to church. I'm talking about people that are raised in church. If I were to teach that God created the heavens and the earth like I'm doing right now in six literal 24-hour periods, there are many people, and it might be you, that are listening to me right now, or you might be you online that say, I disagree with you, Brad. I have much more information than you do, and God's word says. See, many people would say that God created the heavens and the earth in millions of years or billions of years, depending on what you're referring to. And you've got to realize that when I first became a Christian, I disagreed with the teaching I'm giving you today. Let me say that again. When I became a Christian... I didn't believe that God created the earth in six literal days because I went to college. <laughs> and I knew more than you guys did because I was smart and Christians were dumb. But now I'm a dumb Christian. So now, so now I got a problem because is there such a thing as a dumb Christian? And the answer is no. I think there are uninformed Christians. I think there are Christians that understand God's word. But... As I went through, I think there's a majority of pastors, a majority of, of, of Bible teachers um, and Bible colleges that would say, hey, we know the earth is millions of years old or billions of years old, and, uh, you know, we don't think that's true. I mean, after all, doesn't the word just mean era? I mean, like I said, you know, back in the days when I went to school, well, what does days mean? Oh, that means era, back in the generation, back in the time. So couldn't the word day mean that? Well, the answer is, in, depending what context you're talking about, it could. So to understand the word day, you always need to look at the literary context or what's being spoken, and you're going to misunderstand them. When I, when I was uh, raised, I was a Catholic. I was taught that God created the heavens and the earth in six literal days, and I didn't have any, any reason not to believe that. Um, when I went to grade schools in the 60s and then high school in the 70s, I don't recall any myself, I was thinking back, do I recall my sixth grade teacher or my fifth grade teacher start talking about evolutions and millions of years? And the answer to you is no, I don't recall that. Do I recall in high school a history teacher talking about millions of years? I don't recall that back then. Do I recall even my biology teacher talking about it? The answer is no, I don't recall that. However, that's not the world that your kids are being raised in today. That's not the TV channels that you're being raised in today. Because when they go in fifth and sixth grade, they're already being indoctrinated. They talk about dinosaurs this millions of years, 165 millions of years ago, 100 millions of years ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth. See, when I grew up, we had creationist cartoons. Do you remember this creationist cartoon? That's, that's a prompt. There you go. Isn't that a creationist cartoon? Who, who, what's the name of the dinosaur? Dino. I love these old people. Dino, yeah. <laughs> I love them. Dino, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And the girls what? Uh, and the boys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I got it. We're, we're rolling now. But that's not an evolutionary cartoon. or, or page. That's what? A creationist. Because it's having man who they say was started five to seven millions of years ago, coexisting with dinosaurs who theoretically went extinct, you know, 160, 000, 160 million years ago. So I grew up thinking, I believe in that. That all made sense. Freddie wouldn't lie to me. But then something happened. I went to college, and I was a, my, a biology major, and immediately the first thing I was taught in bio one was the evolutionary concept that the earth was billions of years old. And so I, I had to stop and I went through that. You had to learn the material. I remember taking some cellular biology classes and things didn't make sense and I'd ask questions. And I'm having this hard time now putting this, 
this, this new thinking into my brain, but now I got all this information, and I'm looking at different uh, morphologies of different animals, and I'm saying, well, this came from here, and I had all the tree all figured out of evolution. Then my senior years in college, I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Amen? And I'm now a born-again Christian. I'm a born-again Christian with my computer that's already been pre-programmed. Got it? Reprogrammed. My computer now says, the earth is now billions of years old. Man is five to seven million years old. We started from a slug, and this is who we are. Life came from non-life. That's what I'm being taught here, right? Now I bring that into my Christian walk, and I'm having a difficult time. So I did what a lot of people do to perceive that I'm still smart and believe, but really to reconcile what I believe here now in my Christian walk. And so I called myself a theistic, theo means what? God. A theistic evolutionist. In other words, pop up the definition. I believe that God used, no, the back one there, that that God used the process of evolution to create the world and everything that's involved with it. That he created first the single cell organism and then that evolved and that God maybe helped that process or didn't help the process, depending. There are different, we'll talk next week about the day-age theory. We're going to talk about next week about theistic evolution compared to progressive creationism. We're going to be talking about these different things. I want you to know about them because you might be in that camp right now. I, and, and that's fine if you're in that camp right now. I want to show you that I was in that camp, and it still allowed me to believe this evolution myth at the same time to say I believe in the Bible. But then something happened again. I started studying God's Word. And as I started studying God's Word, I had a conflict with God's Word said compared to now my beliefs. Does that ever happen to you? We all come with junk. We all come with things and beliefs. And then we come with God's Word, and you read God's Word, and you're having this problem reconciling with what you believe to what God's Word says. But I believe God's Word is true. I believe God's Word is is eternal. I believe God's word is living and alive. I believe God's word is truth. What happens is people approach how the universe was created, and they approach it from everything was uniform, and they approach it that the geological columns were created in a certain way, and therefore we have to read it, and that it's a billions of years old, and therefore that's how they look at life. Versus, let's see what God's word says, and then see if there's a clear explanation for the things that we see in the world. And the answer is, yes, there is. And that's what we'll be going through. You see, the problem with theistic evolution is it doesn't make sense theistically. Nor does it make sense evolutionary. It contradicts both those different beliefs that we had. So I was in a quandary. So let's look at verse 1-4 again. It said, God divided the light from the darkness. He called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first, what does it say? Day. If you were to read this passage, as I shared with you, you would read it and see the morning and the evening, and in context, you would see that it's a 24-hour period of time. Every single time, because it defines itself as a morning and evening. But I want you to note, it doesn't just do this with day one. If you read verse 8, he says, and he called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the what? Morning, another 24-hour period, was what? The second day. Verse 13, he calls the evening and the morning was the what? Third day. He does the same thing on the fourth day. He does the same thing on the fifth day. He does the same thing on the sixth day. So I got a concern. The concern is every single day he's calling a literal 24-hour period. If you read through this chapter without any external influences being brought in, you got that? If you read it, what does it say? It says there were six literal mornings and evenings. Evenings and mornings, evenings and mornings. Six 24-hour days. Now, the Hebrew word for day is yom. Say yom. Sounds like yom, yom. And I just want to just make clear that it's clear, and we have one clear context, that evening and morning is truly a 24-hour day. So pop that up the next slide, because that's the number one point if you're, if you're taking notes this morning. 
In the literary context of Genesis 1, we read over and over and over again is what? Evening, morning, evening, morning, evening, morning, evening, morning, evening, morning, evening, morning, six times. And there we have it. Let me give you a second day, a second source. On day four in Genesis 1.14, God says, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. So day four, he puts the moon up there. Day four, he puts the sun up there so that when we have one complete rotation, we call that what? A day. When we have one revolution around the sun, we call that what? A year. They were placed in the sky so that we have a way of determining the difference between a day and a what? A year. It's the same word, yom. It's a 24-hour period of time. You cannot take it. A text out of context is a what? It's a con. It's a con. Remember that. And people will want to con you into believing that. So the second point I made, Genesis 1.14 clarifies that the sun will now provide a division between day and night, and the day is now a 24-hour period of time. Got it? Real clear. Yom means 24-hour. Let me give you one more reference. Should you not believe me on these two points? In Genesis, Exodus 10, when the, the, the Ten Commandments were written by the very finger of God, and God says in verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, verse 10. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord God. In that day you shall do no work, you, nor your sons, nor your daughters, nor your male servants, nor your female servants, nor your cattle, nor your strangers, who is within your gates. Why? For in six days the Lord made heavens and earth and the sea and all that's in them and rested on the what? Seventh day. Therefore, as God rested on that seventh day, you rest on that seventh day, the Sabbath day, which is Saturday. And he's saying, he didn't say as God rested for on the Sabbath, on the seventh day, which is a billion years, he hung out and just rested and ceased from doing any more creative work. you got to hang out for a billion years. That doesn't make any sense. As the, God rested on that seventh day and ceased from doing creative work, you too need to rest and stop that aspect and consider that day as a day that's holy. So the third point I brought out showing that day is a 24-hour is that God himself uh, rested on that day, and the day is spoken of as being a 24-hour period. In other words, when you read Genesis 1, you need to read it in the literary context of what's being written. It means what it says, and it says what it means. So did God really create our world, the universe, and all in six literal days? The scriptural answer is what? Yes. It's yes. It has to be yes. So I'm now having a problem, because I'm getting into God's word. As I'm digging God's word, he's saying, Brad, you got to reconcile that. Because you're taking your outside belief systems, and, it's in, and my mind's going, I got it, so I started reading books. What is the evidence that supports the young earth versus an old earth? What, you hear what I'm saying? And I'm now digging in to trying to find different evidence, and we're going to be sharing that stuff with you as we move on through. Well, couldn't a day in the Bible be like a million years ago? I mean, isn't a day in Genesis 1 just an, al an allegorical term for ages? The answer is no. There's no allegory, there's no metaphor, there's nothing there that that word day in Genesis 1 means anything else but a 24-hour period. If you could show me, talk to me afterwards, I'd love to look at it. But in looking at it, it means what it says, and it says what it means. You can have to come to one conclusion, and that conclusion is the word day means day, a 24-hour period. How about Jesus? What was his beliefs? When Jesus was talking to them about divorce... Jesus said in Mark 10, 6, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. In other words, he taught that the earth was young in the aspect that at the beginning, we had the beginning of the world, and then you had what? Adam and Eve. He didn't say it was six million years or billion years, the things that happened since the creation. He just says, from the beginning of creation. That's when Adam and Eve existed. Six days. You hear what I'm saying? They're created on the sixth day. That's right there at the beginning. Jesus himself taught that the earth was young and believed in six literal days. I just want to close with this uh, 
this, this, this text here. Mark 7, verse 5 and 6 reads, Some Pharisees came and they asked Jesus, he said, Why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And Jesus answered and he said, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. I love that. I'm sorry, guys. As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Verse 8, for laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many such things you do. And then verse 13 reads, making the word of God, what? Of no effect through your traditions which you've handed down. Today, I see many Christians today making the word of God of no effect because they take the junk that they've been taught and they change God's word. They literally add to or take away God's living word, and they're going to receive judgment for that. Don't go and say, I need to tweak God's word to fit my belief system. Ask God to tweak your belief system to align with what? His word. We all come into different things, and we live in a culture where so much things are accepted and, and accepted here. Guys, as we're going to go through these chapters, you're going to see everything's going to make sense. Everything's going to line up. Oh, so that is what the geological calm says. So that is what the evidence says. So why do I believe? And that's different things. So I believe the reason why many Christians dismiss the literary context of a day being 24 hours is not because a day doesn't mean 24 hours, because it does. But instead, they, they add millions and billions of years is because I really think that they can't take their programming that they received here and let it go and believe God's word. That's always the concern as your kids go away, right? Go to school, even go off to college. And there's different things. As you know, they're going to go with that college teacher, and every word out of their mouth is truth. And they are at a, such a susceptible timeline that they just start sucking in all this stuff as truth. That's why you become really stupid at age 15, parents. You know, Dad, you don't know anything. Maybe some of you get dumb at 12. I don't know, whatever age. You. Some of you guys are dumb right now. Sometimes you still stay dumb. Your kids look at you, you're so dumb, Mom. You're so dumb, Dad, because I just know more than you do. And you just smile and just say, God, get them. No, you just say, <laughs> Lord, Lord. Well, maybe you do say that. I don't know what you say. But it's, Lord, grow them in that time. But God's got to grow me. He had, he had to take me. He had, he had to say, Brad, reconcile with these, with these differences. I really believe that if we don't, don't grasp and believe Genesis 1 for Genesis 1, then you've got to realize our, our, our kids and everything else will allow the rest of the foundation of God's word to be blown apart. What's happening is we're trying to go at this world and, and hit moral issues, moral issues, moral issues. You know where the fight's back? The fight is being done in schools over the last 40 years, shooting evolution, shooting evolution, shooting evolution, taking out the foundation that we believe in. And people go, well, you can't believe that. You're stupid. If you can't believe Genesis 1-1. You must be a dummy. And now that whole thing's taken out. And now everything, well, I don't believe anything else then. I don't believe this story and that story. And all of a sudden, they're out there running around, right? Believe what they want to believe. May we as parents come alongside, go and teach your kids, ask them what they learn, do that, take notes so that you have a reason to believe the faith in which we, we have, the hope that we've been called to, guys. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that your word is sure, is sure Father. God, as we sang, uh, you fashioned the earth and you hold it together. We sang that this morning, God. May we believe that, Lord. You hold all all things together, Lord. Do that work in our life. Shine the light more into our lives in these areas of darknesses and these doors that we don't want to open up and allow you to, to grow and to change us. Let us realize that we are, are, are stopping an abundant life of relying on your word because of the confusion, God. So help, help bring this order in our life. Help it grow us as we continue in the book of Genesis. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a super day.